We had tonight's guest on the program not too long ago, but she just won the prestigious Lionel Gelber Prize for the best nonfiction foreign affairs book of the year. So it's a great excuse to have her back on. Joining us now with more on the state of income inequality between individuals and between the rich and poor states in Europe, in New York City, Krista Freeland, author of Plutocrats, The Rise of the New Global Super Rich and the Fall of Everyone Else. And Krista, not only is it great to have you back on the air here at TVO, but we do want to offer you uh, great congratulations on that Gelber Prize. Good for you. Well, thank you very much. And I'm sure it was that great interview we did together that helped me win. I'm sure so that had I absolutely nothing to do with it, but you're very kind to say so. I want to put something to you that you wrote back in February, and that is President Barack Obama's State of the Union speech confirmed it. You wrote, the preeminent political and economic challenge in the industrialized democracies is how to make capitalism work for the middle class. On that, How's that project going so far? Well, I don't think it's going very well right now. And we're seeing part of the problem, if you look, you know, I'm in the U.S. right now, so let's talk about the U.S. for a minute. You see part of the problem in the divergent fortunes of Wall Street and Main Street. We are seeing the stock market hit new highs. The stock market has fully recovered from the financial crisis, but you are not seeing the Main Street economy do that. So something really, really isn't working. You know, another cut on that, which, which is really, this, this will sound like a dry economic fact, but I think it's something that should keep us awake at night, is that since the late 1990s, a new thing has started to happen in the economies of Western developed countries. And that is that we have seen a decoupling of increasing productivity and wages. So what that means is companies are getting more productive, but that is no longer feeding into higher wages or more jobs. And that is devastating, right? Because we used to think that if only you could get companies to be more efficient, more productive, do better, then ultimately that would mean their workers get paid more money and they, are, they hire more workers. That equation, for reasons that people don't fully understand, is no longer holding true. Well, just let me do a follow-up on this before we go to Europe, and that is I thought Barack Obama won the last election in part because he was pledging to, in some respects, go after the plutocrats that you wrote about in your book. Uh, they would have to pay a little more so Main Street could do a little better. What's happened with that? Well, he's done it just, you know, the key thing, is, the key point is a little. So, you know, Barack Obama has pushed on that a little bit. I think you're right. I think that that p campaign promise is a central reason he was reelected. And he has, you know, tilted the scales a little bit, but I think not nearly enough. Does he get the blame for that or Congress? A little bit of both. Uh, I think that this is a very hard political environment in which to get anything done. And, and the other thing is, you know, and it, it's sort of now centrist people are saying this, you know, it, it's not only on the big issues that we're seeing problems, but on very specific ones, that, that's where the real difficulty is. You know, some people have calculated that in Washington, D.C., there are four lobbyists for every elected official. A way to think about that is, you know, voters get one person and businesses get four. It's kind of hard to win with those odds. Indeed. Okay, let's go overseas because much of our program tonight is about the state of play in the European Union. How much is the issue of, or I guess, how is the issue of income inequality playing out uh, in the Eurozone today? Well, I think it's playing out in a lot of ways. One core way is, you know, this the, the central problem, you know, one part of the income inequality story is that you have these, the, the plutocrats, you know, those super fortunes at the very top. But the other side of the coin is the middle class getting hammered and getting hollowed out. And that hollowed out middle class is a big part of the European story and, and a big reason why things are still so tough in Europe. Europeans are having a really hard time getting their economies going, getting the jobs for the middle class. Another big thing that we're seeing in Europe, and this really, really played out in Cyprus, is you are seeing increasingly that nation states 
are having a hard time taxing their rich people. Why was, this, why was Cyprus such a central banking center? Why was Cyprus a top investor in Russia? Not because of the strength of the Cypriot economy, but because it was a tax haven. And I think that is a big part of the European story, a big part of the reason why European government treasuries are having a hard time collecting enough taxes. And it's not only Russian oligarchs to whom this applies. One of the really big stories that actually one of my colleagues at Reuters uncovered uh, in recent months is the extent to which the big US-based multinationals and kind of good guy companies, companies we like, like Starbucks, like Google, like Amazon, are paying very, very low taxes in Europe because of how they play that international taxation game. So Starbucks, for example, over the past 14 years in the UK paid less than nine million pounds in taxes. Think about that, nine million pounds in taxes, that's like a banker's bonus for one year. <laughs> and that's how much Starbucks paid into the UK Treasury over that 14 year period. Does anybody in a position of authority find this predicament to be offensive and do they plan to do anything about it? Well, they do actually. I mean, David Cameron, who is, after all, a Tory, um, when this came to light, ha has really, you know, vigorously spoken out against it and has said, you know, Starbucks, you, you just can't do this. The, the government is not going to function. I think the difficulty is that in a world in which companies are global, and I, I spoke to the general counsel of one of these companies, it was an off-the-record conversation, so I probably um, can't say which company it was, and he said, look, our position is we follow the law. And within the law, it's my job as the general counsel of my company and the CFO's job to pay the lowest possible tax we can internationally. And what that means is, you know, if you're a small little country that wants to get that co international companies to register in your country, you'll have super low corporate taxes and they'll operate officially from your country but do business, you know, in the European case in all of Europe. So, you know, we're, we're at this crossroads where business is really global, governments are really national, and actually, paradoxically, I would argue that we're stepping away from the idea of those big international or multinational governance arrangements that modern business demands, partly because we look at Europe and we say, well, wow, you know, that sort of supra-nation state form of government, it's very hard to operate. So what is, in your view, the, the, the deeper concern as it relates to Europe? Would it be the, the, the gap between the rich and the poor within countries or the gap between the rich countries of Europe and the poor countries of Europe? What should we be more worried about? Well, when it comes to Europe specifically, I actually think the really big problem is the latter one, is not, not only the gap between the rich and poor countries, but the way that economic relationship within Europe has been mismanaged. And I don't think it's the fault of any one person or any one country, but you know, the, the way to think about Europe, I think if you're not a European, is inside Europe, Germany plays the role that China has played in the world economy. So Germany has prospered, done incredibly well with this powerful export-driven economy. But it's dependent on consumers in other places. And, you know, Larry Summers, uh, the former U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, likes to say, you know, the problem with export-led economic growth for one country is it's not a model the whole world can follow. There are no Martians to consume the exports of a planet Earth with an export-driven economy. And I think that imbalance is at the heart of Europe's problems. And it's an imbalance which the introduction of the euro helped to feed. So the introduction of the euro allowed Germany to sell its exports denominated in a currency which was weaker than the Deutsche Mark would have been. Hmm. And in the same way that you know, a lot of people feel that an artificially kept low Chinese currency was a real driver of that Chinese export-led growth, I think the euro and, and the, lower, the lower exchange rate which that allowed Germany to enjoy relative to what the DMARC would have allowed has been a huge driver of German growth. 
but at the same time help to inflate that bubble in Southern Europe. So, you know, easy, easy to say this um, standing from the outside, but really, you know, the Germans need to pay up to keep Europe together. They're incredibly reluctant to do that because they feel that they are the ones full of virtue. Um, and it's these sort of welfare queens of the club med European countries who are scrounging on them. It's not really quite that simple. Right. In our last minute and change here, let me get you to weigh in based on your experience of covering all of this on another thing that we're going to be debating tonight, which is austerity versus priming the pump. Which is the best way, in your view, to get out of the economic pickle we're in right now? Uh, I think we still need a little more pump priming. And I'm glad, I think you phrased the question exactly right, which is out of the current pickle we're in. I think that you can't say austerity is always good or pump priming is always good. It depends on the situation you're in. And I certainly think in the Western developed economies as a whole, we still need a little more pump priming. Gotcha. Christian, it's always good of you to spend some time with us here on TVO. As you know, we are... Uh Fond of you, not just because you do such a great job, but you're one of us. You're a good old-fashioned Canuck, so we're glad that you've got some time for TVO still. And we congratulate you again for your book, Plutocrats, The Rise of the New Global Super Rich and the Fall of Everyone Else, which won the Lionel Gelber Prize this year. Well done. Thanks a lot, and I'll be in Toronto on Monday talking about it. Fantastic. All the best, and until next time. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.